Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for Hand Weavers Guild, and I'm going to be your host today. Today's Textiles and Tea is sponsored by the Appalachian Yarn Company in Newmarket, Tennessee. Please go to AppalachianYarnCompany.com and see their wide selection of yarns, roving, and even check out their farm. Also, the Appalachian Yarn Company is a sponsor, is a vendor at Convergence in 2022, so you'll see them there. We welcome your questions today. We're going to take like the last 15 minutes of the session to answer as many questions as we can. We usually can't get to all of them, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Also, if you will use the Q&A button and not the chat button, the questions get lost in chat. So if you would put them in Q&A, that would be great. Today, we have Rebecca Mezoff. We are so excited. Rebecca is from an art family. Her grandmother, who's 60 years old, got an art degree. And then her grandfather wove on a 60-inch Maycumber loom. She received a graduate degree in occupational therapy in 1977. Then at one point she moved to New Mexico and she took a traditional Hispanic weaving class using a standing loom. Later, she became an apprentice to James Kohler. She's an author, a teacher, a blogger, and a wonderful tapestry artist. And I'm very excited to have Rebecca Mezoff here today. Hi, Rebecca. Hello, thank you for that nice introduction, Kathy. Well, welcome, we are excited to have you here today. I do have to say I graduated from OT school in 1997, not 77, but. Oh, sorry. It's okay, sorry. it just makes me 20 years older, which, you know, once you get to a certain age, you feel like, oh. <laughs> you, you were 10 when you were in OT school. <laughs> that's, a, that's much closer, yeah. <laughs> Um, our first question, always the most important question is, what kind of tea do you like? Well, today um, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so that is just north of Boulder, which is where Celestial Seasonings is. And so That's I right. drink a lot of their tea. This is Candy Cane Lane, which is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I also have a favorite tea from our local tea shop, which is called Happy Lucky's Tea Shop. <laughs> that has chocolate in it. So that's mm -hmm. always another favorite. Well, thank you for joining us today. Let's start off with how did you get involved in weaving? How did you come to weaving? So I, um, like you mentioned, I have um, a degree in occupational therapy. And then, you know, if you finish your work in healthcare and you go off to a job. And I was working in Reno, Nevada. And of all places, <laughs> I'm from the Southwest. And I guess it's still in the Southwest, so. Um, I met the wonderful ladies at the Reno Fiber Guild. A lot of them are still there. They're amazing. And they got me interested in weaving on floor looms. So I wove fabric. Um, this was actually one of the first projects I wove. It's a little lace um, silk scarf that the ladies at the Fiber Guild helped me um, learn how to do. Anyway, then I started doing double weave and I started putting pictures in my work. And I started, I realized that, oh, I want to weave images. Maybe I should think about tapestry. So I moved back to New Mexico. I actually um, took a course at Northern New Mexico Community College in Rio Grande weaving, which is that picture you all showed of me standing on a standing walking loom. That's mm -hmm. a traditional loom for New Mexico Rio Grande weavers. So I did that for a while. And then I met James Kohler, who was a um, contemporary tapestry artist in Santa Fe. And he took me on as his apprentice. So that's how I got started. And then it just um, kept going from there. How wonderful to have worked with James Kohler. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
He was amazing. He unfortunately passed away in 2011 unexpectedly. He was only 58. Yeah. Um, that's actually how I got started teaching is that he had all these classes lined up that they wanted someone to fill in. And um, I learned a lot from him. So I did take a couple of those classes and then I learned how to teach. <laughs> well, I want to go to your book, uh, The Art of Tapestry Weaving. You talk about um, how long it takes to be an apprentice in a variety of areas. And I wanna read one of the statements that I thought were interesting. Once we know a little something about tapestry weaving, it feels unreachable from our living rooms and our home studios. I'd like to challenge that notion. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I feel like, um, you know, it's interesting sort of coming from a weaving fabric, this kind of weaving and then going to tapestry. Um, it's, I think it's easy for us to divide those up and say, oh, this is an art form and this isn't. Some of tapestry weavers do that. And I think that that's um, not, obviously not um, valid. There are a million fiber artists who use weaving as their um, medium, this kind of fabric weaving. Um, so Tapestry can seem difficult because we think of it like the, um, you know, medieval tapestries. We think of these big monumental things that are woven and are, you know, people are still weaving huge things in workshops and, you know, the Australian Tapestry Workshop or Dovecot Studios or the Gobelin in Paris. Um, that seems unreachable. Like I could never learn that. Look at what these, you know, people are making these massive things. So, um, I guess I just want to push back on that feeling that I think is out there a little bit and say that um, tapestry is just the word tapestry is just a description of a fiber interlacement like twill or something else. And so, uh -huh. I mean, why we don't have to make it quite so special. It's been done by people all over the world for tens of thousands of years. And so let's take it as an interlacement technique and make wonderful things out of it and not be quite so scared about it being some sort of special um, kind of weaving. Well, staying with the, the concept of the book, um, how, did you, how did you decide to write a book? I mean, what possessed you? <laughs> oh my gosh. So after I worked with James and started teaching, um, prob I think I probably would have taught anyway. I think I'm one of those sort of born teacher people. And as an, if anyone who's an occupational therapist or has worked with therapists know that it's, it's sort of in your bones. If you're going to go into that kind of field, you like to teach. So, um, and I already had a lot of experience. I was an OT for 17 years. So I had a lot of work in sort of teaching people other things. So um, um, yeah, so the getting to how I wrote the book, sorry, my mind had a little, one of those little, wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> um, so I taught for quite a few years in person in workshops while I was still working as an OT. And then at some point I actually had an OT job that I did not like. Um, I loved, I was working in pediatrics. I loved the kids. It was a lot of fun every day to play with kids on the floor. It was outpatient therapy, but my boss was really tough. And um, just, I was like, I, you know, I need a change. I'm going to take a few months off and make an online class thinking that it would just be a, you know, oh, just a few months. It's not a big deal. Um, turns out online classes take a lot of work, but um I knew, you know, I've been teaching tapestry. I was really interested in, in expanding what I was teaching. So I made this first online class and I had enough people jump on to the class that I kept putting off when I was going to get a new OT job and I never went back to it. So really? at that point, I'm much more, you know, invested in um, who else is teaching tapestry? What's out there? Who's, you know, who's putting this information together? And I realized that though there are some excellent tapestry books, on the shelves that are, you know, you think of Nancy Harvey and Carol Russell, especially, but there are others out there that are wonderful. Those books were written 20 years or more ago. And I think we learn a little bit differently now. We, those are very narrative books in terms of you read the text and to find the information. And so I wanted to do a book that was a little more accessible and went along with the online class. So it's more, um, you know, the broken up in terms of here's this is the technique we're learning. Here's the steps to do it. And here's some images that go with each step instead of having this sort of narrative. And at the end, there's a picture of what the finished thing should look like. Um, 
so yeah, I guess that's part of what made me do it. Just the fact that there wasn't a book out there that was newer and also that it seemed like a fun project to me <laughs> at the time. At the time. <laughs> well, it's incredibly comprehensive. I, I'm, I'm just amazed at the detail and how much you've included in that. Um, one of the things I was reading about in the book is when you talk about designing and I was curious, and this is from someone who doesn't do tapestry. So all you tapestry people will probably be rolling your eyes at this, but what is the biggest difference between designing and planning for a tapestry uh, loom versus working on a regular tapestry loom? A floor loom versus a tapestry loom. I'm sorry. And when you're designing those two things. Okay, cool. I set my camera up today just because this for this question, because this is a floor loom, like I think what you're talking about. This right. is a, sorry, not that question. <laughs> I still rug loom. Okay, well, anyway, um, versus so that's the kind of loom you might weave fabric on or other kind of weaving. Right, right. And then this is an upright tapestry loom, which is I think what most people think about in terms of tapestry. the The short answer is that the designing isn't any different. Okay. Um, there is a little thing where if you're working on a loom like this, where you can see a lot of the tapestry at once, visually, um, for a lot of people, that's more important. They really want to be able to see everything they've woven. Uh -huh. Whereas when I'm weaving on this loom, it gets rolled around and I can't, oh, right, right. Yeah, I can only see about 10 inches at a time, maybe. So um, in terms of designing, I think it's the fabric works the same in terms of when you're weaving. Um, I definitely have a full scale cartoon pinned on the wall when I'm using this loom so that I can keep track of where I am. And I'm actually marking on the cartoon that I'm using on the loom. Well, I'm I'm at this line and that's what this is on the cartoon. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, but otherwise there really isn't any difference. I mean, a loom is just something that holds warp threads taut. And so um, <laughs> It's more just a, how much of it can you see? Well, that goes right into my next question because you are so well known for the wonderful little looms that you continually post online. And I'm, I'm always curious about this. So what is the role that the little looms play for you? Are they um, playing your creative process? Will they be another piece of artwork when they grow up <laughs> or are they freestanding works on their own? That's another um, good question. <laughs> for a good, a real good example of that is I think we have this image is the Petrified Forest Diaries. If you could talk some about my question and that piece of work. Sure. This, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's all about, so when I was learning like James Kohler's loom was a hundred inch Cranbrook. Like we, I was weaving big things and I never, it was many years and it, in which I never thought about weaving smaller things. I didn't have any small looms. I didn't, um, mm. if I did sampling, I did it on the big loom before I started the big piece. But um, then as I was out on the teaching circuit and looking at people who were coming to my workshops and, and started wanting to travel with the loom, I was like, you know, I, I can't bring this big loom with me <laughs> when I go somewhere and I, I really, I love hiking and going outside. And one of the things I like to do is um, use nature as an inspiration for weaving. And so that was probably the start of the little looms thing was that, oh, I want a loom I can carry with me. And so I, I started messing with it and it was so much fun. The little looms are accessible. You can warp them quickly. It doesn't seem like, I mean, you don't have to pay thousands of dollars for a loom to get started. You just need, you know, hundred bucks and you can have a loom and yarn and warp and um, all of that. So part of it was that travel piece for me, part of it was the teaching, you know, the accessibility and getting people into the medium is easier on a smaller loom. Um, but I don't really think of the small pieces as um, little pieces that need to grow up. I think it's a different kind of format. So small format tapestry has, um, you know, its own, it's, a, it's sort of its own art form. It's, it's actually, I hate, I think I can say this out loud. I actually think in a lot of ways it's harder than um, weaving mm -hmm. on a larger loom because there's, if you want any detail, it's, you have so few warps to work with. It's much more difficult technically. But um, so that petrified forest piece started with 
um, an artist residency at Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. I was there for a month and I had decided before I went that I was gonna do this project where every day I would weave a two by two inch tapestry on a little hokit loom, which is just a um, wooden frame loom. And because I wanted, I wanted to spend most of the days out hiking and experiencing that beautiful park. And then I spent every evening weaving a piece about what I had seen that day. Actually, when the weather was really nice, this was November and there were some days that were dicey, but when the weather was nice, I actually did a lot of the weaving outside. So that experience actually kicked off a lot of the Little Looms stuff. I had actually already made, I have a class called Weaving Tapestry and Little Looms, an online class. And I actually already made that class. And in my mind, I, I wasn't connecting the Petrified Forest thing, but I that class kicked off at the same time that artist residency started. And so um, those two things sort of meshed with each other and, and the Little Looms practice became actually a big part of of what I do, um, especially when I'm busier, because you can weave something that's small. So a lot of it for me, I call my tapestry diary, including that petrified forest mm -hmm. piece. It's just a response to something I see, or I'm playing with um, a new yarn, or I do some spinning. So sometimes I'll use hand spun for those small pieces. It's a lot easier to manage hand spun in a small piece in tapestry than if you're not a real even spinner, which I am not the best. So. <laughs> Yeah, so You're I got an artistic spinner. I, go. Yeah, you know, I can do thin yarns pretty well on a spindle, but once I go to my wheel, I'm like, yeah, I'm still all over the place. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think the Little Looms is sort of a, it's almost a different practice. It's more of a diary for me, but I think there are a lot of people for whom it is their whole practice, and that is completely valid. Yeah, when I try to explain to people about the Ham Weavers Guild of America Small Expressions exhibit. It's like, it's not take your big piece and shrink it. It's a whole different approach when you're doing something that's 17 by 17, mm -hmm. or whatever the exact dimensions yeah. are. Yeah, your design process has to be, does have to be different because the size is different. So people experience a small piece up very close. They'll come right up and look at it. Mm -hmm. And when my, you know, a tapestry that's six feet wide, they're probably going to stand back. And so, Actually, it's more forgiving too. The bigger tapestries, people aren't examining quite as closely and the errors maybe aren't seen quite as well as they are in a small piece. I knew I wasn't doing tapestry for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned inspiration and I wanna talk a little bit more about that if you could. Um, you talked about you get some of your inspirations from the outdoors. Um, where else do you get inspiration for your work? Um, I grew up in Gallup, New Mexico, which is actually not that far from Petrified Forest National Park. It's just on the other side of the border of the state line, sorry. Um, so the desert, the desert Southwest, and, and again, this is the nature thing is important to me in terms of this. I have a real um, love for horizon and open skies. And I think that comes from growing up in a place where there's no trees. <laughs> but um, I'm also always been really fast. You know, I'm not, uh, a scientist in like geology terms or biology or that kind of thing, but I'm always um, have been really fascinated by geology and the strata in the rocks. And a lot of my pieces come from those ideas and those sort of hook into um, an idea of time. And I sort of, you know, humanity is struggling a lot. I think humanity has always struggled a lot, but it's, it's a little bit, um, comforting to me that the geology of our world shows that it's been here a long time. And even if humans screw up so bad that we're not around anymore, the earth will keep going. <laughs> um, so the, those thoughts about time and geology and layers of things, you know, how we, as we're learning, we're adding layers. Um, and it's just a very human thing. And then there's other, um, there are other pieces that go along with that um, human piece. Um, for example, the, in the current Small Expressions show, I actually have a piece called Refugee Blanket, which is about um, the refugees trying to get out of, um, you know, horrible war-torn Middle Eastern and other parts of the world um, coming across on boats. And um, I saw a movie by Ai Weiwei that, um, show people being welcomed by rescuers with blankets. And so that's where the oh, piece came from. But it's that little hook into um, humanity and how we deal with the world. And, you know, it's the kind of stuff 
that artists always talk about, but um, yeah. for the most part, I, it's much more grounded in sort of older concepts of geology and time and layers of things. Well, one of the pieces I really in, enjoyed and I love was Emergence 5. Can you talk about the inspiration for that? Yes. Yeah, that's a great example, actually. That's a really concrete example for this. This particular piece, um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to James Kohler again. Um, my teacher, um, I was his apprentice for about three years and then I said he died unexpectedly in 2011. So the weekend that he died, I was driving to Chaco Canyon with a friend who happened to be another weaver and, um, and our partners. And I got a phone call just before I left. So it was Chaco Canyon's in the middle of New Mexico. It, literally, there's no cell service. There's nothing out there. It's desert. I, I mean, there's a lot of desert. It's really beautiful. But um, last, I was just minutes from losing cell coverage. And I got a phone call and I answered it. And it was someone telling me that James had died, which was just a complete shock. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah, he just, he was young. And there, I had no idea he was that sick. But um, this piece came about you know, we spent maybe five days at Chaco just wandering around and I just kept thinking, you know, what, what is this? Like, I just lost this important piece of my education and my, you know, practice. And um, what does that mean? And so this piece is about um, the spiral is something I've been working with. It comes from petroglyphs. I lived at that time in New Mexico in um, a house that was in the center of a petroglyph preserve. It was just a lucky thing that my landlady owned this house that was in the middle of all of this land that was covered with petroglyphs, which is um, north of Santa Fe away, a ways. And so this spiral was all over those rocks and it's um, a symbol for, they think um, current native people say that it's a symbol of sort of moving on in your journey to the next world. Um, so I use that sort of as the background of this piece. And then the rocks really come from Chaco Canyon and the reference in this piece, sort of in the bottom left, you see that dark sort of jaggedy form. Mm -hmm. That is an outline of um, Pueblo Alto, which is one of the great houses at Chaco Canyon. So that was a particular place. And I don't usually reference particular places in a tapestry, but because this was in my mind a lot about struggling with James um, dying, I included that almost just for myself that I was referencing that place. So that was a lot about, you know, the geology, those little rock forms that are almost just floating as sort of like a grasping at um, grounding, like finding that the grounding in the rocks in terms of losing that piece of my life and then having that reminder of the spiral sort of as the Southwestern part of the country, but also, you know, James moved on in a journey, we're all moving on in a journey. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where that piece came from. Well, that's, that's amazing that that piece has to do with, with James Kohler. I didn't realize that when I chose it, but um, yeah, because I'm an admirer of his work too. I, it was well, in the, yeah, the color gradation in that piece is something that I learned particularly from him. I don't know many other tapestry weavers that really use that kind of hand-dyed color gradation. So that was also another nod to what he taught me. Well, when you're talking about um, your images and your ideas, when you're designing, what, how do you begin your, your pieces? The, is it an image, an idea, a color? Do you start with a cartoon? Picking your brain here. <laughs> Sometimes, so I don't start with the cartoon, but I do start, it's usually an idea actually. Uh -huh. um, usually I think the idea comes first, like that example with the Chaco Canyon, the floating rocks in the great house. And just there's something about that image that stuck in my head. Um, so it's, and I usually an idea, something like that. And then, um, Often there is color. When I think about how I design, it's a lot of the first stuff is in my head and there's almost always a color associated with it. And most of the time it's blue or purple. So it's really not that sh shocking at all. But, um, and then I start um, sketching. So I do a lot of the initial stuff, just like scribble. I'm not a great drafts person or, or drawer. Um, 
I've, I've had a few classes in drawing, but I'm not, it's not my, you know, that wouldn't be my medium ever, but I will scribble, you know, scribbles about, here's the idea. This is what I want there. This is what I want here. Okay. If the form is more complicated, I might actually use Photoshop and, um, you know, find some image that has a similar form and, you know, either um, use a drawing app to trace part of it or, you know, modify it somehow. A lot of times I'll trace shapes and then print out multiples of them and move them around and lots of different ways to play with um, ideas and how to place objects in, uh, you know, the field of what's going to be the tapestry. And then I don't actually make the cartoon until the very end until I'm ready to put it on the loom. So I've pretty much made all the decisions before the final cartoon is made. I do do a final drawing, which is usually, you know, like desk sized and not if we're talking about a big tapestry. And then I bring it to a copy shop and I have it blown up to the size I'm going to weave it. Oh, really? and I put, yeah, I put it on the wall. And if I'm looking at it on the wall at full size and it's not right, then I have to go back and do it again because sometimes this size will fool you. It will look like, oh, this is what I have in my mind when it's only, you know, 10 by 10 inches. And then you blow it up to 50 inches wide and you're like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> So. Well, I think you've kind of explained it, but someone asked, could you explain what a, a cartoon is in okay. relationship to weaving? Yeah, so for tapestry, most of what we're doing is some kind of an image. And so um, we have, the cartoon is the picture that we're weaving, basically. It's usually on some kind of paper that goes behind the warp and you refer to it. Or I often will draw the cartoon marks right on the warp with um, permanent marker but other people just have it hanging behind. And it's just a reference for what the shapes are going to be to make the picture. Okay, thank you, Chris, for asking that. It was a good question. Um, I keep going back to you that you're in OT. That's okay. <laughs> I just think it's, it's incredibly, it's a relationship. So how do you think your training as an OT has impacted on your work? I think, um, when I was thinking about, I've thought about this over and over ever since I left OT. Actually, my my OT licensure comes up again soon, and it's this is like a, you know, a perpetual issue for me. Do I renew my license or or am I finished with that? You know how that closing yeah. the door is hard, yeah. because I loved being an OT. Um, I honestly don't think I'll ever go back to it, but there's that little piece of me that's like, well, what if? Um, being an OT was about learning to interact with people and like to see them as, um, to see who they really are. To be a good therapist, you really have to be able to get, OT is about function. It's about figuring out what people need to do in life and how to get them able to do it. So it could be like, you've had a stroke and you need to learn to dress again, or you need to learn to drive or do something for work or, um, there's a lot of OTs who work in schools helping kids with their learning process. Um, but it's also about figuring out what is important to that person and you know what do they need to create and what, what are they thinking about? How do they engage with the world? A good therapist will be able to, at least if you're working with someone for very long, figure out those more important issues. And so I learned a lot as an OT um, about how to listen to people, I think. And um, I don't know if I'm good at it still, but um, that was part of that discipline. And I think that that really expands to being an artist. It definitely expands to being a teacher in a big way, um, listening to what people need to be able to learn. But in terms of the artistic ideas, a lot of it's just about being able to see the human part of people and, um, you know, something about being an artist is translating ideas about the world into something that a viewer is going to look at. I mean, you don't, I mean, some of us make art, sometimes I make art just for myself. I don't care if anyone else ever sees it, but a lot of it is we want to show other people and we have a message. So I think being able to, I don't know if that's sort of a tenuous connection there, but being able to understand, you know, where people are coming from in terms of making a piece of art that is powerful to a viewer is I think there's some connection. So yeah, I miss being an OT sometimes, but most days I'm really happy that I don't have to go to the hospital to work. Especially now. <laughs> especially well, especially during COVID. I really big, big shout out to all the healthcare workers. I'm an art therapist by training. So I I'm on that parallel path of 
do I want to do art therapy again? Or, you know, so I understand where you're coming from there. I, yeah, I love art. Had I known art therapy existed when I was going to college, I might've chosen that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit here because um, you are the queen of social media in my book. Um, you were doing social media before social media was cool. And I think you said in 2014, you started, you taught your first online class mm -hmm. you know, long before COVID and everything. And you've really used it um, so well. And I just want you to talk a little bit about um, how do you think the social media, this digital stuff has impacted on you personally and also you as an artist? That is an, that's a great question. Um... I will say that I probably would not have been successful with the online class if I hadn't started writing a blog back. I know that some, oh, okay. some people think blogs have fallen out of favor, but I started my blog in 2008. And so I was yeah. writing that long before um, I ever thought I would ever teach even. Um, and I was just writing about tapestry and whatever else was going on in my fiber world. but. Um, I think that that actually had a huge impact just in terms of a run it, now I run a business. And if I hadn't started that blog back then, I would have been all those years sort of behind. I mean, I had a website and people found me and that's just actually a lot of the goal for a business owner with social media is just getting yourself in front of people so they can decide whether whatever you have to offer is useful to them or not. So, um, yeah, I used Facebook for a long time and um, I still use Facebook. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the social media platforms I use. So so um, Facebook and Instagram and Instagram came along, gosh, I don't even know, but I don't think I've used Instagram more than a couple of years, maybe three years, four years. I lose track of time, but I love, I think artists love Instagram because it's so picture heavy. So um it's, it's a way to share the things that are happening in the tapestry world or in my world, or a lot of times I'll share things that my students are making, um, if obviously if they give me permission, but just as a way of saying, hey, look at this. Part of my underlying goal for running this business is I, I want, I don't want tapestry to die. And I feel like there's a, you know, it's been kind of it's been one of those mediums that is um, people are a little bit afraid of and it's not and they feel like, oh, I have to go to school for 10 years to become a tapestry weaver. So putting little things on that seem accessible on a platform like Instagram or Facebook um, makes it seem more doable to people. And and I guess the the last thing there is just that I think making things so, so helpful just for all of our mental health. I'm not saying that most people I teach will ever be professional artists of any kind. I just think that spending time with your hands, making things, especially out of yarn, because I love yarn, um, is just a helpful thing in life. So um, the social media has impacted my work and my artwork in terms of, well, maybe, maybe I'll say it's impacted um, my business, certainly in terms of marketing. It's impacted my artwork. I'm not I'm not sure always in a positive way. This is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And so this is something, maybe I'll have this discussion further with other people in the fiber arts community, or we could talk about it on the HGA Facebook page or something. Um, I feel like we get really, um, as we're scrolling, we're really looking at, it makes us feel bad. It makes us feel like, oh, all I'm seeing are these beautiful, wonderful things. Nobody ever shows you the stuff they're making that was a disaster. And so actually part of my mission is to show more things that just didn't, I do this in my classes quite often, like this did not work. Look what I tried and this was horrible. Because we, it just, I mean, I think this is true for a lot of people that it, it sort of makes you, um, yeah, there's just, you don't see a lot of failures. And I think there's always failure. It's all about practice and we mess up all the time. So. Um, and then I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not making art because I want to show it on Instagram. Like I want to make art because of an inner drive, not because I think, oh, that'll be a good picture for Instagram. So that's always something I'm thinking about as I'm designing or making something. 
I do show a lot of stuff on <laughs> Instagram, but hopefully it doesn't come. I didn't make it because I wanted it to show up on Instagram. We have inspiration of... on, on Instagram. I don't, yeah. It's been so much fun watching the things that you do and, and, so I don't think you have to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> that's um, funny. Yeah, that's all you needed was my approval. So that's I okay. totally, I feel, yeah, I feel better. I just, it's just something I think about now and then. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are asking, and I'm curious too, can you talk some about the yarns that you use and the dyes that you use? Because you do your own dyeing, right? I do. Um, for my large pieces, my large format pieces, I dye all my own yarn. I use a yarn made by Harrisville Designs. That's a great um, image of some of my hand dyed Harrisville yarn. It's um, Harrisville Kohler Singles. They renamed it a few years ago. It was, I think James, my teacher James actually asked them to, to make this singles yarn. And so they've been doing it for, gosh, I guess it must be like 12 years now or so. And so I do, I dye it myself in large part because I want to get this kind of gradation. So I can get that by using, um, I do use synthetic acid wool dyes. I use Sabre Set dyes from um, Pro Chemical and Dye. They're really light fast and wash fast. They're great dyes. And I have a lot of fun messing around with the colors and the dyes. So, um, so when I'm doing smaller pieces, there are a whole raft of yarns that I like to play with. Weaver's Bazaar is a um, company in the UK that makes yarn for tapestry that comes in all kinds of colors. And um, let's see, there's another UK yarn called Appleton. And then there's, um, there's, there's a, a long list of, of yarns that I like to play with. But I like to dye my own yarn mostly because I can have control over the colors that I get. And for tapestry, that's can be pretty important being able to get the colors you want. If, the, if you only have, you know, 60 choices in colors, you're probably not going to have the kind of gradations that tapestry weavers like. So you want to have like a light and a medium and a dark. And in my case, I might want 10 or 15 colors in that range of the same hue. So um, yeah, so let's see. So that's the weft and the warp is, I use cotton same twine. So my warp is cotton. Okay, all right. And I use a Swedish cotton same twine from Bakken's in Sweden. The um, Scandinavians make great warp. Norway and Finland also make great cotton same twines that you can get in a lot of places in the United States. So it's just, it's very slightly stretchy and it is super strong. So it makes a fantastic tapestry warp. So did you start dyeing right away after you started doing tapestry or did that come later? Yeah, so I did actually. When I moved back to New Mexico and took that Rio Grande weaving course at um, Northern New Mexico Community College, one of the things I learned there, I had a full semester class on dyeing with acid wool dyes. It was one of the best courses I've ever had in my life. It was, um, it was you know, three days a week of all day long dyeing dyeing different colors. And um, I, I would not be the dyer I am today without that experience. And then I started working with James Kohler, who also dyed his own yarn. So I did a lot of work as an apprentice. That means that I was working for him for free. And in exchange, he would teach me. So I was in his studio a lot. And um, there were whole periods of time where he was dying. And I spent a lot of time stirring his dye pots. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure who asked this. I'll find out and give them credit. But someone was asking, how did you how did you hook up with James Kohler? Did you send him your work and say, would you please let me be an apprentice? You just showed up on his doorstep. Robin that's, brownies. I don't know. That's a great question. And you're not they're not going to. Yeah, I'm not sure they're going to like the answer. Well, maybe it's a, it's an interesting story. So I when I was in school at Northern, um, doing this Rio Grande weaving, which is a traditional Hispanic weaving in New Mexico. If you think of Chimayo weaving, that will give you some idea of what that was. It's a lot about patterns and symmetry. Um, what James Kohler did was very different. And he came one day to give us a lecture one afternoon in one of the classes, I don't know what class it was, and he brought a tapestry with him. And I had probably been into Weaving Southwest. And I know that I had seen tapestries other places, but I had never seen his work before. And he laid this tapestry out on the table. Um, 
I think it was one of the rhythms of nature and tapestries. And I just was blown away. I was like, this is absolutely what I, I knew, like right in that second, I want to do this. Um, and so I, I gathered my courage and um, James is a really nice guy, but you know, I was a little intimidated. I gathered my courage and I went up to talk to him after the lecture. And um, he, I talked to him for a little while and he said, you know, you should come and work with me at Penland. So keep in mind, this man lives about 50 miles from where I lived. Right. But his suggestion was come and take a class for me. And I think you should come to Penland. So Penland School of Crafts does two week long courses. So I, I did actually go to Penland and I took his two week class um, that next summer that, yeah, it was only a few months later. And um, I, that is where I really got to know James better. And so he then got to see my work through, I worked with him for two weeks there and he got to see that I was um, pretty fierce about wanting to learn this. And so then um, we had a discussion while I was there about, he said, you know, I take apprentices. If you'd be interested, let me know. And so then it actually was a couple of years later. I ended up moving out of state for a couple of years, um, still working as an OT. And then again, one of those breaks where I'm like, nope, I'm going home again. And I, I um, emailed him and I said, you know, remember you said I could be your apprentice. Is that still on the table? So <laughs> 2008, I went back to New Mexico and became um, his apprentice. And so it was, I guess it really was a, um, an experience of him getting to know me through working with me as a student for a couple of weeks before, um, before he was willing to say, hey, you could come and work with me. <laughs> so I don't know how, I don't think that many people actually take apprentices. I don't know how that process might work for other people, but um, that's what happened for me. Oh, serendipity, that's great. Well, um, I have one more question and it wasn't really on the list, but I'm dying to ask it. Again, okay. as an art therapist to an OT, um, process versus product. I've asked other interviewees about this. What is your idea or do you have one over the other that you favor of process of weaving and your final product? What do you think comparing those two? I. I am such a process person. I it's hard for even for me to even imagine being someone who is so invested in the final, more invested in the final product. Of course, I care whether the final tapestry um, is something I like or not, but I love the process so much. I love the dyeing. I will spend. Uh, some of my students who know this are laughing at me right now. Um, I will spend weeks and weeks dying, as in I need another set of samples. So I can we, you know, die like 10 samples at once in, in jars, you know, like you do. And uh, I will we I will die hundreds and hundreds of samples, just like, oh no, this isn't right. I'm gonna do it again. And then I'll spend more time dying the actual yarn for a big tapestry. You need a lot of yarn. And uh, it's 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 almost silly because I have a whole shelves of yarn I've dyed that I could use, but I love the process so much. There's something about just diving into this thing that it's like that um, feeling of flow that they talk about how you get into a process of something and um, you just can't let it go. It, it which it maybe is good. I think, I think I come up with better designs and ideas when I'm in that kind of place. Mm -hmm. So if I'm dying, I'm thinking about the project that I'm going to use the yarn for. When I'm weaving a project, I'm thinking about possibly the next project. So um, definitely much more about process. Product, um, I just, um, it's great when a tapestry works out and it's lovely and it gets into a show or, or um, any of those things. But I just, that's not the first thing I think about when I get excited about making something. Do you, I don't know this. Do you do a lot of commission work or have you done a lot of commission work? I have done a few large commissions. Um, I did some smaller commissions. I like to say my first commission was three tapestries for a church, but it, it was my mom's church. So I'm not sure it counts, but it was like really early when I started weaving. And so I'm still kind of proud that I have, they still use them on their pulpit for the um, three of the four seasons. I never made the white one. Um, but no, I've done some, uh, just a couple commissions for, I guess maybe four um, commissions for offices or private homes. And um, I, you know, it's an amazing process working with someone um, in the commission world, but um, 
yeah, I find it somewhat frustrating because I have an idea of something that I really want to do. And if the client doesn't want me to do that, then I have to, you know, go with whatever they want. And yeah, yeah. tapestry takes so long. It's like, I don't want to spend a year weaving a piece that wasn't the design that I really wanted. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah. For, for now, I've steered away from commissions. I don't know if I'll do them again in the future, but for right now, I just don't have that much time to weave. So I've, um, put those on, I actually took the commission page off my website because I didn't want anyone to ask me about it right now. Uh, all right, we have so many questions. So I'm gonna start asking. I think some of these were probably answered as you were talking. Okay. Um, this one, oh, this is a great one. This is from, um, I think it's I or L, I can't tell, O'Neill. And she was asking, um, what type of tapestry loom do you prefer in terms of ergonomics? Um, especially when you weave so for so many hours? That's a great question. That's a great question, especially to ask of an OT. Good job. <laughs> um, ergonomics was one. I used to teach a class for weavers about ergonomics. Um, it is, it's an excellent question. It And of course, this is a frustrating answer, but it depends because it depends on your particular body. I love this Harrisville Designs um, loom. I like having the horizontal warp in front of me. As I'm working, I like to be able to just, you know, as a tapestry weaver, it's slow. And so you're sort of working on one area and then you move to another area. I like that body position. Some people hate it. Also, this is a big loom. This was designed by Peter Collingwood who was over six feet tall. And so for me, it works fine, but if you're short, this is not the loom for you. Um, other people really like upright looms like this Leclerc that has the Christmas lights on it. Sorry, it doesn't have a tapestry on it. So it's hard to see it there, but. Um, that um, I learned on a horizontal loom. And so that working on a loom where I have my hands up in front of my face all the time, even if it's lower, um, is more challenging for me. I don't like what it does to my shoulders. Oh, okay. So, but that those are, you know, for big looms, for small looms, you have much, you know, greater, much greater options. I use um, Mirax tapestry looms a lot. And Shaft has a new tapestry loom called the Aras, which is amazing. Right. Um, so those looms are, well, the, the Aras probably has to sit on a table, but the Mirex are, are um, come in all kinds of sizes and you can put them on an easel or lean them against a table. Um, changing your body position as you're weaving is what I'm saying is important. And then the other thing about being able to advance the warp. So some looms, um, there are, you know, amazing, Archie Brennan used um, pipe looms where the warp he did warp them so that the um, piece would roll around the loom. But often, you know, he, you know, you're climbing as you weave. You've seen pictures of old old looms like this, where the warp is stationary and you have to move your body as you weave up. So that I think can be hard <laughs> on you, depending on how old you are. If you're super, you know, you're 25, it probably doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> Being able to roll the warp around or advance it somehow so that it stays near the bottom of your loom ergonomically, I think is um, an advantage. That's what the OT in me says. The artist says, well, then you can't see the whole image you're weaving, but you know, it's a trade-off. Well, kind of going into this, we've had a couple people, and this is from Michelle, but a couple of people have asked is, what loom would you recommend for an absolute beginner? Uh, it um. I'll give you two choices. If you want to weave something that's a little bit larger, um, I really like looms that have tensioning. So the Shack de Ross that I mentioned or any of the Mirex looms um, work by, you know, basically you have a square frame and you're expanding against the warp and that's what gives you tension. Higher tension is makes weaving tapestry easier, especially as a beginner. So um, I like those kind of frame looms that have tensioning. If you want something even smaller, there are lots of little um, peg looms. I, when they get to be too small, the warp is really hard to work with. So I like ones that are at least eight or 10 inches long, maybe even a little longer. There are looms like the um, Schacht also makes a peg loom called the Easel Weaver. It's a really simple, inexpensive peg loom that um, is easy to weave on. There are a lot of beautiful handmade looms that you can get that are, um, you know, made of wood. They're gorgeous. They cost, they might cost twice what the shack loom does, but they're also really fun to use. So 
for small things, something that's like, you know, 10 inches square with pegs is great. For a little bit larger, any of the Merex looms or a loom like the Shack de Ross. There's a few others out there. Those are the main ones in the United States. Well, Christine was wondering, what do you use to um, weave a study? If you do oh. a small one. Yeah, I always yeah. use um, either Merex looms and I have I have Merex looms that weave to five inches wide and ones that weave, I think my biggest only weaves to 20 inches wide, but they make one that weaves to like 36 inches. Um, almost all of my samples and teaching are done on Merex looms. I've been using them for a long time. Um, and the Shack loom is brand new. So I've just gotten that within the last year. Also, it's fantastic. Um, so we're talking about a loom that is, um, you know, gives you a big enough area to weave a nice sample. The third kind of loom, which um, is easy to forget about is a pipe loom. So you can make your own loom and there are instructions for this on my blog oh. and many other people's blogs. You can make your own loom out of copper pipe or black pipe in less than an hour and it won't cost you very much and it will have tensioning. And um, that is another great option. Well, Robin Atkins and Kathy Reed both had COVID related questions. The first one was, did you make any COVID related work during this year? And the other one was, how do you, do you think COVID has impacted on you as an artist? Okay. Um, so COVID related work. Yes. <laughs> um, so I do this, I've been since COVID started when the first day that Colorado was in lockdown, which was in late March, um, I started a program that I call Change the Shed, which is just a thing where I turn on a camera in my studio. It's on Wednesday mornings um, and I just weave. And so I'm showing you whatever it is I'm working on. And so I started that in March and I'm still doing it. And I have done, um, the piece that I'm working on right now is the COVID one that I'm thinking of. It's um, it's called hand basket. It's from that, you know, that saying, I thought, um, I thought there would be a hand basket about going to hell in a hand basket. So it's a little piece about, um, you know, the struggles of the last year, including COVID and whatever else went on in the world. Um, there were a lot of things in 2020. So that's my one COVID related thing. Um, I also, Colorado had huge wildfires in 2020. And so I did a oh, little sorry. series of work about wildfire, which isn't really related to COVID, but um, I do have a whole series of ideas. I like, I'm thinking of them as the pandemic diaries, like a whole series of little pieces about um, little, like 12 to 14 inches square um, about the past, about this whole time, but um, have not had time to weave more than this one hand basket piece. Um, and as far as influencing me as an artist, absolutely. Um, the stuff going on in the world, you know, there's days where it makes you not want to work because <laughs> it's just everything feels so hard. And there are other days where it's like, you know, gosh, this is, you know, look at what's happening to humanity. We should comment on this or use this as our artistic, you know, whatever inspiration. And that, you know, like everyone, I think I flip flop back and forth between depression and I'm going to use this as a, you know, idea for work. Um, and of course, COVID also shut down all of the teaching that I was doing, um, <laughs> except online. So that gave me a little more time to do some other things. <laughs> yeah, it did all of us, didn't it? Yeah, all of us, yep. Um, I'm trying to grab as many of these as I can. Um, One thing I was, I thought was, um, somebody was saying, did you ever work with Rachel Brown? Ah, it's a good question. Oh, I don't know who that is. Yeah, so um, Rachel Brown was, actually, she's one of the reasons I got interested in tapestry. So the first tapestry, contemporary tapestry that I ever saw in New Mexico, I grew up in Gallup, which is right on the edge of the Navajo Indian Reservation. So I grew up looking at Navajo weaving. And then I went back to this school that was Hispanic weaving. So the other, you know, those are the main traditions of weaving in New Mexico. But there was this gallery in Taos called Weaving Southwest. It was run by Rachel Brown, who was a woman who changed the fiber world in the Southwest. Um, 
And by the time I moved back to New Mexico, she was quite elderly. And so I did not ever take a class from her. I, I wish that I had known her when she was younger. She did marvelous tapestries. Um, she changed, she invented the, that walking loom. She, she didn't invent the walking loom, but she sold a version of the walking loom. She did a lot for artists in New Mexico in terms of her gallery. And yeah, yeah so in Taos, she had a gallery called Weaving Southwest for a very, very long time, including, I think it started Rio Grande Weaving Supplies, what it originally started with. So she was supplying materials to weavers around um, the area. So by the time um, I got back to New Mexico, she was quite, I think she was definitely in her 80s. And she accepted me into her gallery when I started making pieces. And there are pieces of my work in Weaving Southwest. And then in 2012, um, the gallery, as I know it, shut down. And it, it, she died and the gallery shut down in the same week. Um, her granddaughter, Teresa Loveless, was running it at that point. So yes, I knew her sort of, and I wish that I had known her earlier in my life. Well, thank you, Leslie. And then Sarah Garcia was also asking about uh, Weaving Southwest. She was saying Rachel developed a series of graduated colors for tapestry. Oh yeah, so they had, right, great. Um, they had this amazing, um, until about two years ago, you could still get this yarn. Um, I don't know what the base yarn yet was, but it was a two ply, um, tapestry yarn and um, Teresa and her husband were hand dyeing this yarn in like hand, seriously the only commercial sort of commercial selling of yarn that was hand dyed it was astounding to me um, Teresa's um, ex-husband now whose name I am now blank blanking on um, just started a business called Taos Wools and he is hand dyeing churro yarn to sell. So if you're interested in the yarn that Weaving Southwest used to sell, he's doing the churro, but I don't think the tapestry yarn is in production. Okay. Yes, it was gorgeous. They would do gradations of these amazing colors and many of us miss that yarn a lot. I bet. <laughs> that was an amazing place. I actually got to go there. Um, and they were very involved in um, the Wool Festival there, right? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I think Rachel was involved in all New Mexico fiber, Northern New Mexico. She just had her hand in everything. Sheep production and um, yeah, wool production, sheep, all of that. Well, I have a lot of uh, nuts and bolts kind of things here. Liz Bivens uh, would like to know um, the set that you use on a small pipe loom versus the set on a big loom. Is it different or is it the same? Weaving is weaving. That's a great question. No, the, so for tapestry, you have to match your set to both your warp size and your weft size, the weft size especially. So, and of course, the closer the warps are set together, the more detail you get. So the short answer is I teach at eight ends per inch. It's a really accessible set to use. A lot of looms come easily warped at eight ends per inch. Um, my next big piece on this loom will be at eight inches per inch. Um, but there are many tapestry weavers that weave much finer sets as in more warps per inch. And there are people who weave at wider sets. By the time you get to about four ends per inch, you're really looking at like a rug. But um, yeah, there's a, a fairly wide variety, but I recommend eight if you're a beginner. It's a good thing. Go. I'm sure somebody's gonna ask that. Yep. Um, on the walking loom, is that mostly just throwing the shuttle back and forth kind of weaving? Because somebody was saying, did you use a pattern on the walking loom? And if so, how did you transition from pattern to imagery? Yeah, so the walking loom is specific to um, Rio Grande Hispanic weaving. So if you Google Chimayo weaving or Google um, Irvin and Lisa Trujillo, they're very famous Rio Grande weavers in Chimayo, New Mexico, you'll mm -hmm. see what I'm talking about. It's it's um, Southwestern patterns. I'm sure you've seen them. They're very symmetrical in terms of, there's lots of angles and ge it's geometric. So the walking loom is still tapestry. All of those little pieces are all um, being put together to make a design. I guess some people would call it a geometric design more than it's, it's not usually image, realistic image based. Um, so most Hispanic weavers don't actually use a cartoon. They might have a little scribbled plan, but they've done it for so long. They know, you know, they're counting the number of sequences and they're making their shapes symmetrical, top to bottom and side to side often. But look up Irvin Trujillo, I-R-V-I-N Trujillo, and um, his work is really 
amazingly outside of the box. And that will give you an interesting look at what that tradition is like. Um, a couple of questions about your, your process. Somebody was asking, do you use a sketchbook? And then somebody else, that was Catherine Ross. And then someone else asked, what um, software do you use for drawing? Oh, great questions. Um, I do use a sketchbook. I have multiple sketchbooks. Um, I But I have like a main, it's like a 12 by 14 inch or something, just a plain old um, plain paper sketchbook that I keep ideas in. I think this is a huge tip for um, anyone who's sort of new to an art form. You'll have ideas as you see stuff or you'll take pictures or whatever, like scribble them down because you won't remember them tomorrow. Um, so I still do that all the time when I have ideas about a project. I have projects that I've sort of been working on for years and years. And I just keep starting, oh, I have another idea about this project. What if it was like this? And I'll write the idea down or colors or yarns or something. That's hugely important, I think, to the process just because it my memory is crap and I won't remember later that I had that idea. So when I want to work on something, I have this this sort of file of all the ideas pertaining to that, that I can then work through. Um, in terms of the computer, I use, um, for, for modification of photos, I use Photoshop. I used to use Photoshop Elements, highly recommended. It's not as complicated as Photoshop. I'm not that good with Photoshop, um, but I know a few things that I can use um, here and there. And then I just, about a year ago, got an iPad. I never had one. And the program Procreate is great. So it's really fun to use. It's a very powerful program and it's a lot less complicated than something like Photoshop. So I've, this past year, I've used Procreate a lot for um, refining areas of design. I'll usually refine something I wanna use and then print it out and, and actually bring it back to paper as I'm designing the final thing. Well, I can't stand it, but it's, it's time to quit. Thank you so much. The one thing I love about this, and I'm hearing it from other people, and you did this today, Rebecca, we do appreciate it, is just giving people new ideas and whether it's using your, you know, your iPad or, you know, a cartoon or, or whatever. But thank you so much for coming on today and sharing with us your work and your ideas. And um, I hope you'll come back and we'll continue. There's more to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been so fun to talk to you all and um, just hook up with HGA is such an amazing organization. So, um, so glad that you asked me and absolutely we can talk anytime. There were a lot of questions we didn't get to. So I'm assuming they can email you and they yep. can get those questions answered. Yep. My um, website is right there. Or if you can't spell my name, it's tapestryweaving.com. Oh, there you go. All right. Um, so contact um, Rebecca that way if you have more questions. Um, again, I want to say a huge thank you to Appalachian Yarn Company for sponsoring today's program. Again, they're going to be a vendor at Convergence, and we look forward to seeing them. Go online, see their website. They have the cutest little alpacas you'd ever want to see. Um, and if you would like to sponsor your guild, you personally, your business, please go to our website at weavespindie.org and we would love to have you sponsor an event, one of the Textiles and Teas. Um, Textiles and Teas is also um, supported by the generous donations from Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, please support HGA by becoming a member or donating. And you can do this again at weavespindie.org. If you wanted to watch this again, um, if you didn't get to see the whole thing, you have a friend who would like to see Rebecca Mezoff. Um, this was recorded today and you can go to the Hand Weavers Guild of America Facebook page and watch it again. Um, please join us next week. We will have Laura Viata. Um, she's a weaver who uses a lot of natural uh, materials, but she also is kind of known for weaving the weaving transparency technique. So we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you again. Thank you, Rebecca. Y'all have a wonderful week and happy tea. <laughs>